Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Labor Day is not on the Christian liturgical calendar. It is a United States cultural holiday. But this year, we're going to take a moment to think about it. God created us with remarkable bodies, with gifts to do marvelous things. Some of us grow food to feed the community. Some build houses. Some solve problems. Some create beautiful clothing. Some are athletes. Some cook delicious meals. Some protect us from fires. And some keep us healthy. Back in the 19th century, it was common for companies to provide company housing for employees. In small company towns, such as Little Phoenix, Maryland, workers could walk to work and to church. Back then, one of the social justice issues was child labor and the right for children to go to school rather than laboring all day. Another was for the length of a work day so that workers could have rest with their families. The company housing, which sounded nice, meant that the employers could expect long hours from workers who lived near their job. Around the turn of the century, activists were campaigning to limit the workday to only 12 hours. Methodist women were always especially involved in watching out for the welfare of workers and their families. And this is why they were so involved in the Women's Christian Temperance Union. The concern was that bosses would have their workers labor for such long hours that on the way home they would drink their paycheck with cheap gin. The Methodist women were concerned for the families waiting for that precious paycheck at home. We take pride in our work in being able to provide for our families, but there are times when we find ourselves out of work for various reasons. One of the concerns of society is always to create a safety net for people when they fall on hard times. In the story of Ruth, three widows are all that is left of a family. Naomi tells her two daughters-in-law to return to their own people. They are still young enough to remarry and bear children, but she will return to her people. Orpah does as she is bidden. But Ruth refuses to leave Naomi's side, and together the two widows return to Naomi's home of Bethlehem. There the owners of the fields would not harvest the crop completely in order to leave some for the poor to glean or harvest the remainder. This was one way in which they provided for the widows and the orphans. And so Ruth went to the field belonging to Boaz, a kinsman of Naomi. And there he instructed his workers to leave extra wheat behind for Ruth to glean so that she and Naomi would have food for their table. In the Acts of the Apostles, we have the story of Tabitha, who is also known as Dorcas. Tabitha was a most industrious lady in the early church. They wanted to take care of all the Christians And the deacons, such as Stephen, were especially charged with the care of the needy. So Tabitha got involved in the ministry of sewing clothing so that all would be warm and have dignity. In our story, the women of the church are showing Peter all the beautiful clothing which Tabitha had made to give away. We are created by God with the most marvelous gifts for labor. Some of us use them professionally and others as volunteers, but we all strive to use them for the glory of God in service to God's children. In our gospel story, we hear a parable from Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is like, this story tells of a master and his servants whom he is entrusting to care of his assets while he is away. The one who was given the most invests them well so that he is productive and doubles the assets which were entrusted to him. The master tells him, well done, good and faithful servant. The second one was not given as much, but he also invested them well and produced a significant income. He also is told by the master, well done, good and faithful servant. 
But the third one, who was given the smallest amount, was only fearful of losing it. He was unwilling to take any risk, to try anything productive. Instead, he buried it in the soil to preserve it as it was until the master returned. He squandered his opportunity to be productive. Needless to say, the master was not pleased. It is easier to take risks and try new ventures when things are going well and we are comfortable. It is much more difficult to take risks when we feel like we are at risk of losing everything. Some people do not let hardships hold them down. They see the opportunities which they have been given, no matter how small, and find ways in which to be productive in spite of injuries or change of circumstances. When I was at Mount Tabor, I had a couple, Clara and Charlie, who were parishioners. They were elderly and their health was failing, but they were determined to find ways to serve. Clara was in a wheelchair and Charlie was in a walker, and yet they came to church every Sunday, one way or another. And Clara would do her ministries from home, writing cards and making phone calls to encourage people, especially those who were ill. Charlie collected cans that he could turn in for recycling, and they stayed active in spite of their limitations. Each of us has been entrusted with gifts to do marvelous things, and each of you has found your own way of utilizing those gifts expressively. Churches are full of disciples like Tabitha who care for those around them. I can think of many wonderful examples right here at Timonium. There are those safety net ministries that try to lift people up when they need help. The nimble fingers gather to knit for the hospitals. Teams go to the Appalachia Service Project to repair homes. Folk make casseroles for the Sharp Street Hot Meals Ministry. Members volunteer for Habitat with Humanity, building homes for ownership. We drop off food, which is organized for the food pantry. And we bring school supplies so that no child is embarrassed or needs to go without. There are many important ministries to build up disciples here at our church. The choir, handbells, liturgists, and altar guild help to make our worship beautiful, rich, and meaningful. Many people serve as teachers, leaders, and helpers with our Sunday school, vacation Bible school, Bible studies, and preschool, forming our next generation of disciples. Many ministries go on behind the scenes. Trustees putter around on Tuesdays looking for things to repair. On Monday, the tabulators do their work of counting and depositing our offerings. The finance team does its magic with the budget and our investments. We have church dinners and a fun auction of gifts. Some of our labor is just for fun and to give gifts away. I enjoyed seeing all the beautiful quilts made by our sister June, and the model airplanes made by our brother John were amazing. I know that they were cherished by all who received them. Some uh, plant beautiful gardens to tend, and I always remember Phyllis whenever I'm deadheading my geraniums. It reminds me of visiting her. When we come to the end of our time on this earth, we hope that we have led a life full of the love and support of friends and family, a life full of the satisfaction of work well done. We hope that we too will hear those beautiful words, well done, good and faithful servant. Thanks be to God, amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. 
holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. Jesus spent three years with his friends, teaching them to be disciples who followed the ways of God so that they could teach a next generation, and they could teach the next generation on down to us. On the last night in which he was with his disciples, he created for them a way to remember him, and he took the common bread of the table, gave thanks to God, and he broke it, and he gave it to each of them, helping them to remember his sacrifice and how they may also have to sacrifice themselves for others. And when the supper was over, he also took the cup of wine that was at the table and he reminded them all of the new covenant that would be made because of his sacrifice that would give us all an entry into the grace of Jesus Christ. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I offer you a remembrance of Jesus Christ. A remembrance of the life of Jesus Christ. Take and be thankful for the new covenant. <laughs> 